From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Andrew Court. Johnny, how'd you like to go to San Francisco? What's up, Andy? Well, we've written a lot of insurance for an independent contractor out there, a man named Arnold Bennett. Uh-huh. Last night, his latest project went up in smoke. An office building he completed a month ago. How much is the policy worth? There were five companies involved. They took it on at $100,000 apiece and turned it over to us. Half a million bucks? Yep. I talked with the arson inspector for National Fire Underwriters in San Francisco. He said the fire looked phony. I'll pack my things. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation, 4065 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bennett matter. Expense account item one, $15, flowers for my girl. I wasn't able to keep our date. Instead, I met Four State Fire Investigator Andrew Cord at his office, and we made immediate arrangements to fly to California. Item two, $25.06, one raincoat. Item three, $144.15. Air transportation, Hartford, New York, San Francisco. Our route, Andrew Cord, fill me in on the details concerning Arnold Bennett. Oh, Johnny, as things stand now, Bennett hasn't filed claim yet, although I imagine that'll be coming through pretty fast if I know him. I met him once when he was in New York getting money to finance one of his big subdivisions. Yeah, it seems I've heard of him. Oh, he's made time and life... A couple of times each. Oh, yeah. When I met him, I said to myself, Andy, look well on this man. He may be the last of his kind. Oh, how's that? Well, Arnold Bennett must be past 60 now. He's been everything in his lifetime. Sailor, soldier, lawyer, financier, bootlegger, gun runner, Lord knows what all. Talked fast, worked hard, and what he couldn't get one way, he got another. All in all, he's done pretty well. It shows all over him. I didn't like him, Johnny. Well, go on, go on. Well, maybe I was just jealous of his aggressiveness, or maybe it's that I've just heard stories of how he ran roughshod over big and little. It... Well, uh, about this new building of Bennett's that burned down. Yeah, yeah. Well, the man in San Francisco is pretty sure the fire was of incendiary origin. Well, can he prove it? Well, that'll be up to him and you and me. Four state and national fire underwriters are going to handle the investigation. Federal, Great Atlantic, and Tri-State underwriters aren't going to send any men at all. They figure it's best not to clutter things up. But proving the fire was incendiary may not be too easy, Andy. Well, we'll see when we get there. There's a standoff motive in the whole thing. We can start with that. What's that? Bennett's in financial trouble. Big trouble. Taxes, so on. The fire was an out. I see. Well, who's the arson man in San Francisco? Billy Underwood. Oh, good, good. Bill Underwood's one of the best arson men in the business. Well, it's going to take all of us to get Bennett, Johnny. I will split it three ways. We'll let Underwood handle the fire evidence. You can play front for us with Bennett, and I'll comb around in the financial situation. Yeah, well, we sure got our work cut out for us. But listen, Andy, you sound sort of scared of this guy, Bennett. I am, kind of. Why? Nobody's ever beat him. Expense account item four, seven dollars and a half. Incidentals upon arrival in San Francisco. Andy Cord and I checked in at the Fairmount, then went downstairs, rented a car, and drove out to the scene of the fire. Bill Underwood was already there, had been there all day. We all shook hands, and then Underwood broke it down. Bill was a bit of a pedant, had things pretty well organized for us. Now it's this way... A watchman on duty saw a man loitering in the vicinity of the building when he came to work at 6 o'clock. Uh-huh. Three other witnesses remember the same man. A druggist, a filling station attendant on his way home from work, and a newsboy. Got a description? Mm-hmm. I did. Male, Caucasian, 25 to 30, medium build, approximately 170. Dark hair, dark complexion. That's it. Have you talked to the police yet? Haven't had a chance, Billy. You know they got eight men on this? 
Well, with that much of a description, it might make it easier. I sure hope so. So far, the description hasn't fitted anyone in the files yet. The newsboy swears that he saw this man sneak around the side of the building about 6 o'clock. The fire broke out about 6.30. Anybody see him leave? Mm Mm-hmm. The newsboy says he saw him catch a bus on the corner right before the fire broke out. Might help us. The bus driver on the line wasn't any help. He's pretty busy that time of night. Have you had a chance to go over this yet? Well, we started. I'm working with a fire inspector on it. And as soon as we come across anything, I'll let you know. We can't overlook any possibility on this, Billy. Any. Yeah. I know about Bennett. He's been out here asking me who I am, what I'm doing. He doesn't like it. Oh, he doesn't? Yeah. He learned to swear somewhere along the line. Oh, uh, has he filed claim yet? No, we haven't heard. It's a professional firing job. I'm sure of it. You're sure? Well, I, I haven't got what I need in the way of concrete evidence yet, but I'll find it somewhere in these ashes. The place burnt too well and too fast to be anything but professional. It was drafted. The fire got hot and going before anybody even spotted it. Well, this is a little out of my league, Billy. Tell me more, will you? Well, you, you see, an amateur will mess it up generally. It'll smoke a lot and somebody will spot it. But now, a bug, you know, a nut, he'll do as good a job as a professional. Oh. But, but he'll stick around and, and, and watch it burn. Stand a good chance of getting caught. He might even call up somebody and tell him how happy he is. But uh, this bird, the one the newsboy saw getting out of here fast, well, he sounds like he knows his business. Mm-hmm. It's business with him. Then it'll be my job to connect him and Bennett somehow. And that's the tough part. Yeah. All I got to do is play around in the ashes. Oh, um, Johnny. Yeah. Watch a step with Bennett. Sure. He doesn't care about anybody. I spent another two hours with Cord and Underwood covering the ruins of the ten-story office building that had been gutted the day before. Underwood acquainted Cord and me with all of the necessary details, all he could. That night, we sat with the three witnesses at a special show up in the Hall of Justice. Sixty-odd suspects were paraded out. There were no identifications. The next morning, while Cord and Underwood carried on with their part of the investigation, I went out to Arnold Bennett's real estate office near the Presidio. Remember that old saw, how a woman in love is always beautiful? When I walked in, I had no idea Elizabeth Bennett was in love and no idea that she was beautiful. Her sallow face without makeup, framed in a wisp of stringy blonde hair, wasn't flattered by the shapeless black dress and low-heeled shoes she was wearing. Certainly not the going idea of beauty. Now, did her conversation reveal anything to indicate love? Yes, sir. May I help you? Mr. Bennett, please. My name's Dollar. Dollar? D-O-L-L-A-R? He's not expecting me. Your business, Mr. Dollar. Four State Fire Insurance Corporation. It's about the fire that destroyed the office building. Oh, yes. Just a moment, please. Well, what is it, Liz? Uh, Mr. Dollar is here, Uncle Arnold. I don't want to see anybody today. I told you that, you idiot. Mr. Dollar's from Four State. It's about the fire. Oh. Well, send him in. And go out to lunch. Yes, sir. It's all right, Mr. Dollar. Straight ahead. He always like that? He's nice today. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. Hmm? That's your name, isn't it? Yes. I'm Elizabeth Bennett. Go straight ahead. Dollar? That's right. Mr. Bennett? Come in. Come in. I'm not going to ask you to sit down. I know why you're here. You have insurance investigator written all over your face. Well, in that case, we can get right down to the business at hand. What caused the fire? They don't know yet. It was deliberate. What? Somebody started that fire. That's what? And I know who. Get him and you'll save yourself some work. Tony Midas. Tony Midas? Who's that? The crackpot that set fire to my building. He's out of prison now and he swore he'd get me. Well, now look, maybe you'd better tell me just who he is and why he'd want to get you. Tony Midas worked for me once. I caught him stealing money and I prosecuted him. He was sent to prison for five years. And he's the one you want. You seem pretty certain of that. Of course I'm certain of it. I know what enemies I have, what friends. Don't tell me I'm going to have to pussy it around with someone like you and get any place in this whole affair. Well, there are some witnesses who got a look at the man who started the fire, or at least it's a good bet he's the one we're after. So tell me, what does this Tony Midas look like? I don't remember. I hardly ever remember faces. But you remembered his threat. 
You bet your last nickel I remember his threat. And he's the kind of screwy punk to carry it out. Last week, there was a small story in the newspaper that he was being released from prison. Well, then we'll certainly look him up and have a talk with him. That's very good of you, I'm sure. Oh, now, look, this can be a very difficult thing all the way around, or we can all cooperate, Mr. Bennett. I'll cooperate. I know why you're in town. I know who you came with. I met that glorified fire inspector yesterday. Underwood, you people don't fool me, and I'm not trying to fool you. Get Tony Midas, and you've got your man. Did you tell the police about Midas? No, I was waiting for some bird like you to walk in here with your high-handed attitude. Now I've told you, now you can get out and get busy looking for him. Arnold Bennett lived up to all of his advance notices, and then some. I'm paid very well to stand and take what I have to to find out what I want to find out. Sometimes it's not enough money. A review of the trial and proceedings in which Tony Midas had been convicted of grand theft, his threats at the time of his trial substantiated Bennett's information. That didn't surprise me. What did surprise me was that one of the three witnesses identified Tony Midas' mug picture as the man seen in the vicinity of the building the night of the fire. An APB went out for Midas. The San Francisco police began to turn the town upside down looking for him. By five o'clock in the afternoon, the other two witnesses had made up their minds that he was the man they had seen after all. The case against Midas became stronger. It was imperative that he be located. Johnny Dollar. This is Elizabeth Bennett, Mr. Dollar. Remember in my uncle's office? I remember. Mr. Dollar, you're looking for Tony Midas, aren't you? You don't have to answer. I know you are. I think I can help you find him, but he's not the one you're looking for. Look, if you turn him in... Let me finish, and then we'll talk about him. I live at 1038 Mirada Drive. I'll be home in an hour. We can talk there. Two minutes later, when I was putting on my coat, I received another phone call. This one from Bennett's lawyer. He advised me that Arnold Bennett had filed claim and would bring suit if his claim was not honored in the prescribed length of time. I thanked him for the information and went downstairs and began to look around for a cab. A police car careened into the driveway and a familiar hat on top of a familiar head leaned out. Hey, Johnny! No! Yeah, Andy Cord. How's the left, Hello. Hop in. Okay. It's Inspector Truck and Inspector Kane. Hi. What's up? Somebody shot Arnold Bennett ten minutes ago. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the trail gets so rough, a couple of people just fall off dead. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Billy Underwood, Johnny. They're trying to get you all over town. The hotel said to call you at this Skyline number. I'm out at Arnold Bennett's house. He's been shot. What? That's right. Well, who shot him? Don't know yet. I think I'm a transfusion here before they take him to the hospital. Uh-huh. Look, Johnny, I got something to show you. Yeah, what? Some ashes we just analyzed. The Bennett building was fired by a pro. He used celluloid and a wick made out of paraffin. I can prove it. 
I hope Bennett lives to hear that. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation, 4065 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bennett arson fraud. Arnold Bennett was removed to the hospital where he was given a 50-50 chance of recovering from a 38 slug that had entered his chest. There was no weapon lying about and no witnesses in the remote, hilly section of San Francisco where he lived to give any information concerning the attempted murder. The police were more anxious than ever to find Tony Midas, the man Bennett had put the finger on earlier. Their reasoning was that if he could burn down a building worth half a million to get back at Arnold Bennett, he also might shoot him. I told Andy Cord about Underwood's findings when the police car got us to the scene of the shooting. Celluloid and paraffin wick, did you say? Yeah, that's what Bill Underwood said on the phone. Well, then it would point away from Tony Midas. He was an embezzler, not an arsonist. Maybe. Who's that policeman over there? Oh, that's uh, Inspector Dickens. Well, I talked to him about it for a while. He said Midas lived in San Quentin with a man named Hanley, a professional burner. Yeah? Well, Hanley could have taught Midas a few tricks of the trade. Yeah, it's possible, Jimmy. Uh, I don't know. At least Underwood is sure that he can prove it had an incendiary origin. Well, that's the first hurdle. Maybe we can't tie it to Bennett at that, Johnny, if Midas did it. Now, let's wait and see what Bennett has to say when he can talk. I think I'll get on over to the hospital. Okay. Oh, uh, here's something that came up. Yeah? Now, you said Bennett attributed everything to this Tony Midas. Mm -hmm. Well, there might have been something personal in it, too. Midas is married to Bennett's niece, Elizabeth. He's what? Yeah, she married him a month before he was convicted. Well, that might explain some things. Yeah, she called me tonight and said she had some information for me about Midas. I was on my way to see her when this happened. Oh, you you haven't talked to her yet, huh? No, no, let's see. It is 1038 Marotta Drive. I wonder if that's far from here. <laughs> no, Johnny, not far at all. This happens to be 1038, right here. Oh, well, we better tell the police about her, Andy. Andy Cord went on over to the hospital to await results on Arnold Bennett. I spoke to the inspector in charge and told him the information about Elizabeth Bennett. The police added the name to the APB already out for Tony Midas. And that's the way the case stood at midnight. By morning, the hospital reported that Arnold Bennett would recover from the gunshot wound. Elizabeth Bennett had not been located, nor had her husband, Tony Midas. I always fix my own dinner. Poached egg and half and half ulcers. Name's Dollar? Yeah, yeah that's right. Insurance investigator. You want something, do you? Coffee, maybe? No, thanks, Mr. Engel. Mind if I finish? Go right ahead. Well, what led you to me? The notations about the trial, Mr. Engel. You were the defense attorney for Tony Midas. We're anxious to talk to him. I defended him, yes. I don't think I'm going to be much help, Dollar. I haven't seen him since he got out. I've no idea where he is. We'll find him, Mr. Engel. And what's it all about? Well, Tony Midas has been identified as the man who started a fire in the Bennett building. Or at least who was seen in the vicinity of the building when it went up. I'm sorry to hear that. Are you, Mr. Engel? Tony Midas was a nice kid who got in a little trouble. Everything was against him at the trial. Bennett poured it on. He didn't have to, but he did. He could have let him off. You were Midas' lawyer. Did you try to talk Bennett in to let him Midas off? No, I didn't. Nobody talks Arnold Bennett into anything. Oh, Tony never would admit taking the funds. He said he was framed, but he didn't have a prayer with all the evidence against him. Yeah, I read a transcript of the trial. Then you know Tony Midas pleaded not guilty in the face of everything, and he went up. I wanted him to make a guilty plea and rest on the mercy of the court. It was his first offense. Well, he's out now, and it looks like he's trying to get even with Bennett for prosecuting him. All for a lousy ten grand. Yeah. Did he ever get in touch with you? I told you, no. No phone call? No. Do you have any idea where he'd be in town, Mr. Engel? No, I don't. Okay. Then I guess I'll leave you to your eggs. Uh, Dollar. Yeah? If, uh, if you find Tony Midas, I'd like to know about it. Why, Mr. Engel? Oh, just curious. I'd like to see him. I'd like to see what five years in prison does to a kid like that. 
Mr. Engel, Arnold Bennett was shot in his home last night. No. That's all you have to say? What else is there to say? Well, you could have asked, is he alive or is he dead, for one thing. Suppose I don't care. <sighs> okay, he's still alive. They think he'll pull through. Who do you think shot him, Mr. Engel? I don't know. They're looking for Tony Midas for that, too. Oh? Did you know Bennett's niece? Elizabeth, yes, I met her. Well, they're looking for her, too. She's married to Tony Midas. Yes, yes, I knew. I knew about that. So now, Mr. Engel. Oh, what is this going to be, an inquisition? That egg and that half and half doesn't interest you, no matter how much you look at it. Well, you ought to leave me alone and go find your fire bug. Come on, let's have the story. I don't know any story to tell you. Was it spite that sent Tony Midas to prison because of him and Elizabeth Bennett? No, no, they proved him a thief. I'll throw one more thing at you, Engel. Bennett wasn't always too good about paying his taxes. Now, look here, Our accounting Doc. man has him pegged. Pegged him for exactly what he is, an opportunist, a dodger... A man out to get what he can, for as little as he can, no matter what. Yeah, we cover everything in a case like this. You'll never get Arnold Bennett. He's too good for you, Dollar. Too good for your insurance company, your fire investigators, everybody. No man stronger ever lived. We've already got evidence that proves the building was fired. I'm here to get all the story, and I think you're the man who can tell it. Why me? Because you work for him. I never worked for him, never. All right, we'll let that go for now. But you can tell me this. Was Tony Midas the kind of man who'd start that fire? You can tell me if he really was an embezzler. You can tell me if he tried to kill Arnold Bennett. I can't tell you anything for a fact, Dollar. All I have is my own personal opinion. Well, that's what I want. I want that. I'd like your opinion. Now, there's something about Bennett's niece being married to Midas, isn't there? A wife can't testify against her husband. Everyone else in Bennett's office testified against Midas. She didn't. I see. Now the opinion. Oh, come on, Engel, come on. You're right, Dollar, I have got ideas. All of them make me sick inside. Tony Midas stood there and told me he was innocent. He said it a million times if he said it once. He said he thought Bennett was framing him. To cover up from, for income tax shortages? It's just surmise, but it fits. Midas was a green kid hired into the company by Bennett. He might have been hired to be framed on a phony embezzling charge that would give Bennett a good excuse on his taxes for a while. I've... I've been fooled a lot of times. Did Tony Midas fool you? I don't know. I wish I could have gotten him off. I tried, Dollar. Believe me, I tried to get him off. You come here to me and say he's out of prison now and getting even. He's burnt down a building and tried to murder Arnold Bennett. Tony was a nice boy, Dollar. But now his whole life's gone, and for what? I hope you don't find him or her. I hope they go far away and stay away and don't have to talk to anybody ever. They deserve that. I hope nobody ever finds him. But we did find Tony Midas. He was right under our noses all the time. When I got back to the hotel, there was a message for me to get down to the county hospital. Cord was waiting for me there. They took us downstairs, and then we were both standing in a room looking at Tony Midas. Before they took him across the hall to the morgue. It's a funny thing, Johnny. There's been an alarm out on this guy for 36 hours. Everybody's been looking everywhere for him, and he turns up right here. Only he's dead. Yeah. What killed him? TB. He had it awful bad at San Quentin. It's in the sick ward his last two years. When his time was up last week, he made them release him. But he wound up here and died in this hospital. It's rough. He's just a kid. Yeah. Up until that time, there had been some kind of a case against Tony Midas. But obviously, since he had been dead almost two days, it was impossible to connect him with the attempt on Arnold Bennett's life and the firing of the building. So we were right back where we started from, trying to make a case against Arnold Bennett, who still lay in his hospital room and refused to talk to anybody who came near him. All right, Johnny, now what? Eh, Bennett's going to be hard. We're going to have to work around him. His niece is the best opening I can think of. I could worry she. Police haven't located her yet. Huh? No, not a trace. Andy, she had some information for me when she called last night. I still want to get Hi, it. If I... oh, oh, hello, Bill. We got a break. George Foley's in town. Who's that? Best celluloid and wick man in the country. If you happen to want a building burnt down. One of the policemen at the hospital spotted him in the lobby trying to see Arnold Bennett. Not entirely, Johnny. Where is he now? They followed him to an address on Barengo Street. They aren't going to move in until we decide something. 
Twelve minutes later, Andy Cord, Bill Underwood, and I were standing in front of a decrepit-looking boarding house on Barango Street talking to the three policemen from the San Francisco Police Department. Dollar? Underwood? Hi. Hey, uh, what's the story, officer? Well, the way we see it, Foley's still trying to get part of his money for burning the building. He took a chance coming to the hospital tonight to see Bennett. No kidding. He'll probably make another try. You boys have more at stake here than anybody. If you want to talk to him, try to make a deal with him to turn on Bennett. Now's the time. Now, what do you say, Johnny? Oh, wait a minute. We aren't sure of anything about him. Well, he fills the bill, Johnny. Paraffin and Wick jobs are few and far between. With nothing more than that, I'd stake my rep on Foley being our boy. For what it's worth, all three witnesses now pick his picture instead of Midas. Oh, well, a good defense attorney, get that thrown right out. What do you want to do? Oh, well, let's shake him up a bit, okay? Go ahead. We'll be covering the back and front. Come on. Shot, Andy? All right, all right. That's enough. That's enough. You okay, Bill? Andy? Okay. Yeah. All right, tough boy. Get on your feet and let's get out of here. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, we have an arsonist right in the palm of our hands with very surprising results. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Andrew Court, Johnny. How's it going, Andy? Well, the police have been talking to that arsonist, George Foley, all night long. He won't admit a thing. Won't talk about anything. They're wondering now how long they can hold him. He's the man who fired that building, Andy. Well, we've got to have something more for the district attorney, Johnny. We haven't tied Foley to Bennett at all. If we can definitely charge him with firing that building, then we'll have a lever to go after Bennett. I got an idea. What? Meet you in an hour. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation, 4065 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bennett arson matter. Expense account item six, one dollar, two drinks. Andrew Cord and myself in Cookie's Place, a half a block from San Francisco's Hall of Justice. Andy's a good insurance man, thorough. Well, it's pretty certain they'll have to release Foley unless he admits something, or we can find more evidence against him. How about Bennett? Still no word. Johnny, you can see what we're up against. Yeah. yeah. Want one? No, no thanks, Johnny. Let's put one on. Listen, we had this case tied into Tony Midas until he turned up dead. A vengeance motive against Bennett for sending him to prison five years ago. Yeah? All right. Now we know it wasn't Midas, and we're sure it's this George Foley. At least according to Bill Underwood, and Bill certainly knows the arson racket. Yeah, no man better. All right, then. Who shot Bennett? Oh, I don't know, Johnny, but that's not our worry at the think, moment. Think, Andy, think. It might have been Foley. It couldn't have been Midas. But there is someone else. You mean Bennett's niece? Sure, sure, his niece. She had a reason because of what Bennett did to Midas, who was her husband. And she's got a reason to help us. Yeah. Nobody can find her. Nobody knows where she is. They'll find her. And I want to make a deal. What? Sure. If I find her, I'll ask her what information she can give us about Bennett and Foley. Possibly she has something. She said she did once. 
Now, look, if she shot her uncle, she'll have to stand for assault and attempt to kill. Can we give her legal help in her case? Johnny, I don't know. I want to know if I can promise her that if I see her. Can I? Well, you can tell her that we'll do what we can, the very best that we can. Okay, good. Want another drink? No, thanks, John. All right, I'll try and get in touch with Elizabeth Bennett. (laughs) How? Police haven't gotten anywhere. Oh, I've been here two days, and I got friends all over this town. Expense account item seven, one dollar and five cents, cab fare. From the Hall of Justice to the apartment house of Marty Engel. Lawyer, philosopher, and egg poacher. Again? Yeah. You better close that door and lock it, Mr. Engel. It's awful late for this. Are you drunk? Nope. Locked? Now what? You asked me if I ever found Tony Midas to tell you about it. Hmm? We found him, Mr. Engel. He's dead. Oh, no. Oh, yes. And he didn't do any of the things we thought he might have done. I'm here to find out what you might have done. How did he die? Tuberculosis. He's had it for two years. Didn't know. No, I didn't know. I didn't know about it. I don't know how to figure you, Engel. I haven't been able to ever since I met you doesn't make any difference what I think of you, but it does make a difference how you answer one question. A lot of difference to you. What is it? Did you help Arnold Bennett frame Tony Midas and send him up to San Quentin? You say Tony is dead. Now, what difference... Did you help Bennett frame him? No, I told you I defended Tony Midas in court. I tried my best to get him off. That's the truth. You sure of that? I'm an honest man, if not a successful one. I told you the truth. All right, then, if that's the truth, you're not in any trouble and you can unlock that door. But if it's not the truth, you might get yourself killed. Why do you say that? Because somebody took a shot at Arnold Bennett last night. But he was lucky. It didn't kill him, but it came pretty near. You know who that somebody was? Elizabeth? That's a good guess. She hasn't got anything to lose now. She lost her husband. She might be out getting even for him if he was framed... And she thinks you helped frame him. I tell you, I didn't frame him. I defended him. I I think Bennett stacked everything against him. I told you that once. I think Midas was an innocent man, but there was nothing I could do. Wait a minute. What? Shh. Who are you expecting? No one. Ask who it is. Go ahead, ask who it is. Who, Who is it? Elizabeth Bennett, Mr. Engel. Tell her just a minute. Just a minute, Elizabeth. Okay, over there. Go on, get down fast. No, you don't! Engel, call the police. Hold it. Hold it, Elizabeth. Hold it up. Are you hurt? You? Are you hurt? Did I kill him? Did I kill him? Oh, Elizabeth, you didn't kill him. He ought to be dead. You don't know what you're talking about. He didn't have anything to do with framing Tony. He just told me. And he was lying. He should be dead. He and my uncle. None of this will bring Tony back to you. Come on now. Come on. Let's get back. (laughs) How many tramps have you met in your life, Mr. Dollar? A few. Come on. Come on. When you met my uncle Arnold, you met a real one. He stole money from himself and made it look like Tony did it. And that one in there helped him. Why didn't you let me kill him? You're wrong about Engel. He didn't help your uncle. He tried to help Tony, honestly. Well, then I'm glad I didn't kill him. How's my uncle? He's getting better. Will he go to prison? We have to prove he hired somebody to fire the office building. He hired George Foley. I know that. Would you swear yes. to it? Yes. Can you? Yes. He blamed it on Tony. When I went over to see Tony last month in the prison hospital, he was dying. Oh, I knew it. He had that that look in his eyes. Helpless. And he knew what my uncle had done to him, and he couldn't do anything about it. But you figured you could. You shot your uncle when you found out Tony was dead. And you came here to kill Engel. I thought he helped Uncle Arnold send Tony to prison. I thought he helped kill Tony. They did kill him, you know, when they sent him to prison. They killed him as surely as if they'd shot him down. Five years I waited for Tony to get out of that awful place. I waited to hold him in my arms and tell him it was all over. 
Five years I waited to help him forget his hate, my hate. I'm loving him so much every day that... <laughs> No, he's dead. And what can you or I or anybody do about what they've done to Tony? Look at me, Mr. Dollar. I'm I'm not what you'd call beautiful. I'm not even pretty. Nobody ever looked at me twice until Tony. He looked at me and he loved me. And now he's dead. And I did inside. I'm dead inside, and I'll be glad when I'm dead outside. <laughs> Shooting in this neighborhood? Wait a minute, officer. Uh, what's that? No one's hurt. Come on, Elizabeth. <laughs> Elizabeth Bennett made a statement down at the Hall of Justice admitting she fired a shot at Arnold Bennett, hoping to kill him. She also admitted the assault on the lawyer, Marty Engel. Charges were immediately filed, and she was held in the woman's section of the city jail. In a separate statement, she told how she had seen Arnold Bennett meet George Foley in a downtown bar. Foley still maintained that he had nothing to do with the fire in the Bennett building and denied any connection with Arnold Bennett. I gave Elizabeth Bennett's statement to Andy Cord, and he took it to the assistant district attorney. I was still in the Hall of Justice when Marty Engel came in. Dollar? Oh, hello, Mr. Engel. How is Elizabeth? They're holding her. I'm not going to press any charges. Well, that's pretty decent of you, Mr. Engel. She's a pretty unhappy girl. I'd like to help her. Her uncle will probably press charges against her. I'd like to defend her. What? She needs a lawyer. I didn't do very well for her husband. Maybe I can do better for her. I hope so. Funny world, isn't it? Not tonight, it isn't. No, I guess not. Yeah. Well, I'll see you, Mr. Dollar. Right. Johnny? Oh, Andy, hi. Kid, you ought to pat yourself on the back. They're going to go ahead against George Foley for the arson job. Enough for them now, huh? Uh, that's a pretty good case against him, whether he opens up and talks or not. A statement from him would still be better. Uh, always. But he's been around, Johnny. He hasn't given anybody the time of day yet. Yeah. Oh, about uh, Elizabeth Bennett. I can arrange counsel for her. She's already got a lawyer, Andy. Okay, then we'll pay his fee. He doesn't want any fee. Uh, what's the matter, kid? <sighs> Boy... Maybe all this has been a little too much. Hey, what time is it? 10.15. There's a plane out at midnight. If you don't need me anymore, I think I'll be getting back to Hartford. Sure, Johnny. Sure, I'll look after things here. 10. Expense account item 7, $49.65. Hotel and meals in San Francisco. Item 8, same as item 3, transportation back to Hartford. I caught the midnight plane. It was in Hartford at 2 o'clock the next afternoon. I went directly to my apartment and went to bed. I was awakened the following morning about 7 o'clock. What the... Johnny Dollar. San Francisco calling Mr. Dollar. Okay. Is this Mr. Dollar? Yes, yes. Mr. Andrew Cord is calling. One moment, please. Go ahead, please. Johnny? Hi. Can you come back to San Francisco right away? Can I... Well, I just got home. We need you again. Jake Eggleston is going to defend Foley in court. Eggleston? He's already got him out on a writ. What? This case is worth half a million dollars to us, Johnny. If anything happens that Foley gets off, we won't have a chance to get Bennett. You sound scared. I am. Somehow, Bennett's holding the best cards again. We got a good case against Foley. Once that's settled, we can get Bennett. I want to make sure. (sighs) Okay, okay, I'll get the first plane. Thanks, Johnny. Even as I hung up the phone, I was thinking of Marty Engel's words. You'll never get Arnold Bennett. He's too good for you, Dollar. Too good for your insurance company, your fire investigators, everybody. No stronger man ever lived, he said. And somebody had to prove Engel was wrong. (laughs) 
Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a fight against a strong man and one of the cleverest lawyers in the country. Join us in court. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Andrew Court, Johnny. Did you have a nice trip back here to Frisco? I slept most of the way. How's it going? Uh, Good and bad, Johnny. Good that we've got George Foley on trial for setting fire to the building. Bad that we haven't connected him to Bennett yet. And Bennett's the guy we want. No, once you get a conviction on Foley, you can go after Bennett. A lot of expert testimony's been thrown around here, and the jury's been sleeping through most of it. Besides that, Foley's got one of the best defense men in the business, Jake Eggleston. Yeah, I've heard of him. He's pretty slick. He's going to make us lose this case, Johnny. Not if I can help it. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation, 4065 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bennett matter. Expense account item 9, $124. Air transportation, Hartford, back to San Francisco again. And the Bennett case, which I thought was finished with. I was at the Hall of Justice by 9.30. I met Andrew Court outside of the Superior Court. This may be the last day of the trial, John. Anything new since I talked to you on the phone, Andy? Well, I may be worrying for nothing since Finley's handled it all pretty well for the state. He's one of the assistant DAs, but Foley's still holding on to a not guilty plea. Well, isn't that just coaching? Oh, maybe. But you remember Foley didn't make any statement when we took him, and the police got nothing out of him at all. Foley had something like 28 arrests besides two convictions. He knew the ropes. Yeah. Oh, that's okay, yeah? Sure. Oh, just in time. Yeah, it seems to be the, the clerk now. Yeah. Court is now in session. His Honor Judge William J. Bainbridge presiding. Everybody stand. Be seated. John Dollar. Hey. Well, I didn't think they'd call you first. No. Raise your right hand. You solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you, God? I do. Be seated. As you know, I'm Charles Finley with the district attorney's office. State your name, please. Johnny Dollar. State your occupation, please. I'm an insurance investigator. How long have you been engaged in your profession as an insurance investigator? Ten years or more. Tell us, please, prior to that, what kind of work did you do? I was in the United States Marine Corps for four years. Before that, I was Detective Sergeant Second Grade with the New York Police Department. Do you have any papers or letters in your possession that verify your professional status, Mr. Dollar? Yes, I do. I have letters of reliability from 13 insurance companies and adjustment bureaus I've been associated with, and my record as police officer. Thank you. Will the court clerk please hand these papers to counsel for the defense so he may examine them? Yes, sir. Thank you. Now, tell us what your connection with this case is, Mr. Dollar. I was employed by the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation of Hartford, Connecticut, to conduct an investigation in regard to one of their policyholders. Arnold Bennett. Yes, Arnold Bennett. Will you please tell the court what the results of that investigation were? The Bennett building was destroyed by fire. I worked with arson experts from my own organization and with the police here to determine the cause of the fire. Go on, please. At the scene of the fire, our expert, William Underwood, located certain items which we recognized as part of the paraphernalia generally used by professional arsonists. Will you please state what those items were? A scrap of celluloid and a paraffin wick. Anything else? Samples of the ashes, which were later analyzed and proved to be celluloid ashes. 
I wish to remind the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that the public fire adjuster, the gentleman from the Skyline <laughs> Laboratories, and the two gentlemen from the fire inspection department have previously testified as to the identity and uses of these items. Will you continue, Mr. Dollar? Well, these particular items suggested that the fire was of an incendiary origin. The next problem was to establish the exact method used in starting the fire. Were you able to determine that method? Yes, sir. In order to refresh the minds of the jury, would you mind describing what was established? A heavy woolen wick. This one, Mr. Dollar? That one, or one like it. Exhibit C. Please continue. This wick had been soaked in paraffin and then stuffed into a paper sack that was filled with celluloid. It's a simple method. The wick is lit uh, and takes anywhere from three to ten minutes to burn down to the celluloid. Now, once that happens, the celluloid flares up and fires anything combustible in the vicinity. And that is the method you determine caused the fire in the Bennett building? Yes. And I'd like to qualify that by saying the arson experts from my own company and the gentlemen from the police and fire departments here in San Francisco determined it definitely. Mr. Dollar, by this means, you connected the defendant, George Foley, with the fire you were investigating? Yes, we did. How? George Foley improvised the method I have just described. Improvised? You mean it is his method? I object, Your Honor. The prosecution is putting words into the mouth of the witness. I'll rephrase for Mr. Eggleston. Is this method identifiable with the defendant? Yes, sir. Will you explain the identification? The police files here show that Foley has been convicted of setting two other fires in this state. On both occasions, he employed that method of fire. Your Honor, I object. The career of the defendant as a professional arsonist is a matter of public record. The defendant's previous record has no bearing on this case, I object. Mr. Dollar, will you rephrase and delete any reference to the defendant's criminal history? The procedure in locating an arsonist is to first establish the method of operation. In this case, where the Wick celluloid method was used, the defendant's name came up immediately. The defendant made an attempt to call on Arnold Bennett in the hospital. The defendant was positively identified by three witnesses as the man they had seen near the Bennett building prior to the fire. I remind the jury of the testimony of those witnesses. Go on, Mr. Dollar. The police crime laboratory examined all of the clothing Foley was wearing at the time of his arrest and all of the clothing in his room. There was definite evidence that he had been in the Bennett building. Will you tell us what sort of evidence, please? Well, uh, paint smudges on the soles of his shoes and metal filings in cuffs of his trousers, compared with samples that were still available in the building where certain painting and metal work had been in progress. You connected him with the improvised method of firing. You proved that paint smudges and metal filings came from the Bennett building. The defendant attempted to contact Arnold Bennett. What else? Arnold Bennett's niece, Elizabeth Bennett, informed me that her uncle, Arnold Bennett, hired the defendant to fire the building to collect insurance. I was on the stand all the rest of the morning. When Finley ended his questioning, he turned me over to defense counsel Eggleston. Eggleston contested every bit of established testimony and recommended that my remarks be stricken from the trial records. The summations came right after that, and then the case went to the jury. Expense account item 10, $3, lunch, for Andrew Cord and myself. Foley has to be convicted or we'll be on the defense when Bennett's insurance claim comes to court. And we'll probably get stuck with it. Hey, while the jury's out, why don't I go over to the jail and talk with Foley? Well, what good would that do, John? Well, Foley must know they'll give him the works if he admits something He'll to He'll admit nothing. He sits there in court like they were talking about someone else. Oh, Johnny, it's too late. Yeah, but if he did, you could go ahead and file criminal charges against Bennett. Beat him to the punch. Well, I'd like that. Oh, we get Foley and we've beaten Bennett, and I like that. The job of getting to a prisoner who's standing trial isn't an easy one, especially when he's under the surveillance of a smart defense attorney like Eggleston. I talked to Judge Brainbridge in his chambers and told him what I had in mind. I broke down the case against Foley as the insurance company saw it, and a possible case against Arnold Bennett if Foley was found guilty. Judge Brainbridge arranged for me to see Foley. He was sitting on his cot. Eggleston was standing nearby. Hello, Dollar. Hello, Eggleston. Hi, what do you want? Well, I thought we ought to talk about this thing while there's still time. If it's okay with you, Mr. Eggleston. It's okay with me, Dollar. 
I'll be right here. Still time for what? To get your point of a break, Foley. Oh, that's a real good one, that is. You sit on a witness chair all morning, you tell him what a bad boy I am, then you walk in here and tell him you want to give me a break. I do. Uh, go away. Uh, now, wait a minute, George. It won't hurt to listen to oh, him. Oh, you're a great one, you. I'm the guy who's sitting in this cell. Both of you can walk out of here and have a good steak for dinner tonight. All right, George. Uh, listen to him. This isn't a courtroom. When you were first hauled in, Foley, you could have made a statement telling us Bennett hired you to fire that building, waived a jury trial, and thrown yourself on the mercy of the court. But you didn't do that. You made everybody work hard to give it to you. And that's exactly what they're going to do. That jury will come out pretty soon and throw the book at you. Hey, is that true? I'm not so sure of that, Dollar. Uh, tell us precisely why you're here. You both know my company's after Arnold Bennett. He's filed claim against us for not paying off his fire policy. Foley, we know he hired you to fire that building. Yeah? And if you're smart, you'll send for the guard and make a request for the court to come back in session before the jury returns. You can tell them Bennett hired you. You can change your plea to guilty and throw yourself on the mercy of the court. It'll probably save you five years on your sentence. And so I turn here on and make everything nice for you to go after Bennett. Huh? If you do that, his claim will be thrown out by the insurance commission and we'll prefer charges against him. And he'd be right up there with me, huh? Making little ones out of big ones. That's right. You're overstepping your province here, Dollar. Oh, now, look, there isn't much time. But Dollar, Foley, I this man can be. advise you to wait until the jury comes in and that won't be very long. But then it'll be too late for you to help yourself. I don't like this high-pressure stuff. I don't care what you like or dislike, Mr. Eggleston. Now listen, Foley. They've got an eight-point case against you in there. Is he right, Eggleston? It doesn't make any difference. The jury you decides. You say it saved me five years on my son. Yes. Uh, George. What do you think? Up to you, George. I've told you what I think. Ah, oh, swell spot, swell. Oh, come on, come on, what is it? I'll risk it. You're crazy. There's a chance those 12 clunk heads will walk out and tell everybody I'm not guilty. Come on, get out. Those last five years will be pretty hard ones. Guard. Guard. Thank you for the offer just the same, Dollar. You don't use your head much, Foley. If it hadn't been for you, I wouldn't be in here. So don't worry too much about what happens to me. If it weren't for guys like you, I wouldn't be in business. And I'm not worried. I'll, uh... Yeah? Yeah, I hope they let me loose on this one. For your sake. Don't plan on it. Oh, on a kind of... I'd like to kill you or something. <laughs> Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a verdict in and out of a courtroom. The wind-up. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Andy, I saw George Foley. I wasn't able to make him change his plea. Well, it was a good try, Johnny. Jury still out? Yeah. That means they're arguing all the technical evidence. I was just thinking. No one really believes we'll get Arnold Bennett. What do you think? I think we will. I know we will. Well, if we can get Foley, we can get Bennett. We have... hey, wait a minute. Hey, the uh, jury foreman just sent for the bailiff. I'll be right there. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Four State Fire Insurance Corporation, 4065 Spear Boulevard, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Bennett arson fraud. Expense account item 11, 10 cents, one phone call to the hospital. The report on Arnold Bennett substantiated the newspaper story that he was recovering from the gunshot wound inflicted by his niece. 
Well, one thing, Johnny, he'll be alive for us if we can go after him. Oh, I wish it'd work with Foley. I think I could have made it work if that lawyer Eggleston hadn't been there. Well, it's after four. You know, if that jury doesn't come in with a verdict pretty soon, they'll have to adjourn for the night. Yeah. Want to smoke? Yeah, thanks, Johnny. I would like one. Here you go. Thanks. Hey, they're coming back in. Hmm? Oh, yeah. Come on. All right, stuffy in this courtroom. Yeah. You? Excuse me. Court is now in session. <laughs> Be seated. Has the jury reached a verdict in the case of the state versus George Foley? We have, sir. Will you please read the verdict in this court? We... <coughs> we, the jury, find the defendant, George Foley, guilty as charged. That does it. Dollar! Dollar! See me, Dollar! Come see me! I got some things to tell you now. Who's with you, Dollar? Andy Cord with the insurance company. Oh. Now, look, I haven't got any deals to offer, Foley. You know that. Yeah, I know. So, so I took a chance. It's a lousy five more years. What about Arnold Bennett? Now, you're a little anxious. I want some information first. They only gave us ten minutes, Foley. Where's Bennett now? He's still in the hospital. He's going to be all right. He's out and I'm in. It's a break. Oh, come on, Foley. Let's have it if you have anything to say. Can you get Bennett? Can you really get him? I'll tell you frankly. We think we can get him with or without your help now. It doesn't make too much difference. Maybe it'll take longer without your help, but we'll get him. The fact that the court is going to convict you for having set fire to Bennett's office building is the lever we've needed. We can go after him now. Do you want to help us, Foley? I don't want to help you or your stinking insurance company, but I hate the idea, Bennett. Mr. Know-and-do-everything, running around, eating good food, and sleeping in his nice bed while I'm rotting away in prison. Sure, sure, he hired me to fire his building. He paid me 2500 bucks to put the torch to that lousy building of his. He said he could throw all the blame on a guy named Tony Midas if it ever came up. We want the facts, Foley. How did he first contact you? I got a friend who knows things, see? And my friend told me to contact him. When? A couple of days before the job. Come on, Foley, who's your friend? I'm not going to tell you everything. Did you talk to Bennett in person about firing the building? I talked to him on the phone after my friend told me about it. Bennett said he wanted the place to go down because he's having money trouble, taxes and all. And he offered me a thousand bucks for the job. Now, wait a minute, Foley. You just said you got 2500 I did, I did. I... I hung up on him when he offered me the thousand. I called him back later on and told him I wanted four thousand. Well, we argued about it and then finally hit on the twenty five hundred. Did you meet him then? Sure. No, no, I never met him. I, I saw him once and I walked by the building and looked it over, but I never met him. Bennett's niece said she saw you two together, Foley. A sworn statement. Yeah, you know, she's a liar. How about the money? How'd he pay it to you? He left it for me in the check stand at the bus terminal over on Fourth Street. I told him how to do that and when to leave it. Now, let me get this straight, Foley. You made the deal to fire the building over the phone. And you went ahead and looked at the job. You never talked to Bennett in person? That's right. And you made arrangements for him to pay you $2,500 by leaving it in the check stand at the bus terminal. Yeah, yeah. When did you make these arrangements? The day before the job. How'd you work it? I just told you. I mean the money. Oh, uh, half of it the first time, and after the job was over, he, he left the other half for me. And you got it all? Sure, sure, in cash. Why were you trying to see him in the hospital after he was shot? To try and shake him down for another five? Oh, Johnny. brother. Come on, let's start over. Well, what do you mean? Oh, you're trying to sell us a bill of goods here. For what reason, I don't know, but I know this. You had to meet Bennett. You had to see him fully. You had to talk it over with him personally. I just told you I picked up the money in the bus time. I don't believe that. Bennett wouldn't have left the money for you to pick up. You could have just gone away with it. And after the building was burned, if it had been that way, Bennett didn't have to pay you the balance. Now, when did you see him? It's pretty important to know when and where and how many times you and Bennett got together. thought you said you could get him whether I told you anything or not. We can, we can, brother. Don't ever doubt that. 
But if you tell us some facts, we can get him faster. All right, now. Where did you first meet him? Was it in a restaurant? Someplace with people around? No, no. Uh, I met him in his car. He was parked on Market Street near Fifth. Uh, that's the way we arranged to meet each other over the phones. Did anybody see you meet him? People on the street, I guess. When did this meeting happen? Night I torched his building. He paid you then? Yeah. The whole 2500 Yeah, all of it. All What'd you do with the money? Never mind. Do you still have it? Never mind. Oh, this is a waste of time. You aren't telling us anything. Well, why should I? Well, why'd you call us here if you didn't have anything to say? Well, I'm saying something. You guys aren't listening. We continued questioning Foley about his association with Arnold Bennett. Each time he explained it, it was a different story. The only thing he admitted was that Bennett had hired him to fire the building. As far as the details of it were concerned, they were lost in a jumble of contradictory answers he gave us. Expense account item 12, $5.60, dinner for Andrew Court and myself. The next morning, we returned to the Hall of Justice to question George Foley once more. All right, Foley. Now, how much did you say Arnold Bennett paid you for the job? thousand dollars. You told us twenty five hundred one time. Another time you said five thousand. Now come on, what was it? Thousand dollars. And when did he pay you? Right after I fired the building. I met him right afterwards down on the street in his car. He asked me if it was all set and I told him to listen for the sirens. And pretty soon somebody put in the alarm and the fire engines come out. He paid me that all right. He, place was three quarters gone by that time. He knew I did a good job. Where was this you met him now? A couple of blocks from the building. Did anybody see you together? No. Where did you telephone him from? From my place. The same night you started the fire? Yeah, yeah. And he brought you the money that night, and you cased the building that night, and you started the fire. All, all this in one night. Now you got it. Now, that's the ticket, boy. It became increasingly evident that Foley was attempting to convince us that he was mentally deranged. In spite of the fact that he'd already been tried and found guilty and was slated to appear at 10.30 the following morning for sentencing. It's an old trick, and with arsonists, where sanity is questioned from the beginning, a good one. However, Foley had been examined by three psychiatrists appointed by the court. I waited in the jail cell with Foley while Andy Cord went out to get copies of their findings. When he returned, we showed them to Foley. Okay, good. Here you are, John. Well, what do you show me these things for? To let you know there's no way to get out of it now, Foley. These are from psychiatrists. All of them had a good look at you. You're sane. You're all right. You remember when they looked at you? No. All right, look at the dates on the paper. You can read, can't you? Sure. January 15th, January 16th, January 21st. Witnesses were around for all the examinations. Well? Well? Are you through playing games now? Okay, Dolly, you guys win. Come on, give us the story. Well, uh, I met Arnold Bennett at the Hopkins Bar about a month before the fire. I made sure I'd meet him there. Now, what do you mean, Foley? Well, I've been setting fires for a living for a long time now. I always have a list of people like Bennett who could use a fire. They get around... I knew he was in trouble four or five years ago with the income tax people. They sent a guy to prison for cover-up. Tony Midas. Yes, Tony Midas. I figured he'd be needing another one pretty soon, so we had a drink. I brought it up. Who paid for the drinks? He did. Who saw you together? The bartender. His name is um, Alfred. There was a maid of D there, a couple of people at the table. I put the proposition up to him. How do you like to have his building burnt down and collect his $500,000 get himself out of trouble? Oh, he said he'd like that fine. I told him it cost him 5000 bucks in advance. He said he couldn't raise that much, but he did manage to get 3500 together. I took it, and I, I did the job. What'd you do with the money? I still got it. Where? It's not going to do me any good now. I buried it in a gallon can in a vacant lot over by the tower. I could show you where. Okay. We'll get you to do that. Swell, I'll be glad. Hey. What? I can send Bennett up the same way you're sending me up. Huh? I can testify against him at his trial. The 
next morning at 10.30, George Foley received the maximum sentence. Two hours later, charges were filed against Arnold Bennett, naming him for conspiracy, arson, attempted defraud, and collusion. A warrant was issued for his immediate arrest, but it was never served. Arnold Bennett died in the hospital that night. In a way, you could still say that no one ever beat him. He beat himself. Expense account item 13, $87.50, hotel and board in San Francisco. Item 14, another $125, transportation back to Hartford. Item 15, $35, miscellaneous. Expense account total, $1,440.37. Remarks? Nothing. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, the Fathom Five matter, death on the high seas. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Lillian Bayef, Stacey Harris, Chet Stratton, Will Wright, Marvin Miller, Hans Conried, Edgar Barrier, and Parley Bear. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. 